nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for our event teaching electronic structure methods and chemistry using simulation tools in NanoHub. Uh, we're very excited to be presenting this webinar today with Dr. Nicole Adelstein. She is a professor, an associate professor at San Francisco State University in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. The Adelstein Materials Research Group uses computational tools to understand and improve materials used in renewable energy technologies with the goal of reducing fossil fuel usage and climate change. Hello, thanks all for coming. So I teach this class. I've actually only taught it um, a couple times, and um, but I decided that I put a lot of effort into making my materials, so I wanted to share them on NanoHub and have other people use them. And it's a very practical upper division and graduate course in molecular dynamics and electronic structure. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself before I talked about the class and how I use NanoHub. Um, I've been at San Francisco State University in the Department of Chemistry since 2015, and I teach general chemistry, physical chemistry, computational chemistry, and I also teach um, some programming, so I teach Introduction to Python for chemistry and biology students. My research is computational chemistry, and currently my group is studying lithium-ion diffusion in solid-state electrolyte materials. And we also study um, atomic scale reactions using molecular dynamics uh, with collaborations that I have with other people on catalysis and even biochemistry to look at enzyme function. Um, at a given time, I have about one to four master's students and two to eight undergraduate students working on this research with me. Uh, I got my PhD from UC Berkeley in Materials Science and Engineering, so although uh, I said that I'm a computational chemist, I actually think of myself as a computational material scientist, which is in part how I got um, associated with NanoHub, because um, at NanoHub many of the users are uh, so in material science. I did my postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory studying scintillators, ma magnetic defects for qubits, and um, solid-state electrolytes, which is how I got into working full-time on solid-state electrolytes. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to tell you how I use NanoHub to teach computation. Um, I'm going to start with a description of the course, Computational Methods in Chemistry. I'm going to show how NanoHub enables quick supercomputer access and visualization. Then I'm going to give examples of my course modules on NanoHub, and then examples of, of some modules that I teach in the course that are not on NanoHub, but eventually I hope to convert to be NanoHub modules. And those modules use Gaussian, which obviously, since you have to pay for it, we can't NanoHub can't offer it for free, so it would be good to find another code that can um, do similar calculations that I use Gaussian for. So this is the course, Computational Methods in Chemistry, and I'm just going to go over the syllabus a little bit like we were in the first day of class. So um, the course introduces the theory and practice or skills necessary to perform calculations of chemical properties. The course is split into a section on electronic structure taught by me and a section on molecular mechanics taught by Professor Guliev. And I'll show you the um, topics that Professor Guliev uh, teaches. And if you're interested in any of his materials, which are not included on NanoHub, you could definitely reach out to me or him through the chemistry website. And we do as minimal um, amount of lecture as possible. We mostly are working on practical tutorials. The prerequisites are graduate or upper division standing, one year of undergraduate physical chemistry or instructor consent. And biochemistry is highly recommended because Professor Guliev is a computational biochemist and they work on biochemistry examples. But for my section of the course, no biochemistry is needed and the whole course is three credit hours. The objectives of the course is that students should be able to apply approximations to quantum chemistry to solve for the electronic structure and properties of um, molecules and solids. 
to identify the limitations of certain approximations um, to create simulations that accurately model real molecules or systems, and to identify the cost versus benefit of running more accurate calculations, and identify the rationale for the certain level of accuracy um, for a given simulation. So we're really trying to help the students gain a big overview of how you pick a simulation to do and why you would do that simulation versus another simulation. And most of the um, courses uh, evaluated based on the homework that they turn in, whereas 20% is on two midterms that we give. And of course, my personal goal for developing and teaching this course um, was motivated a lot by training my research students. So I wanted my research students to have the necessary background to understand what they were doing in my um, laboratory group. And so part of the goal was to uh, collate all the materials necessary to train my students. There's no one textbook I use. Um, I ask students to look at a number of different textbooks. And so I just uh, provide them here so you could uh, if when you get the video recording, you can see which textbooks I use. And now these are the topics that we cover um, in the molecular mechanics part of the course. So this is not the part of the course that I teach, but it's important to understand what the students have already learned before they go into my section of the course. So we just give them an overview of computational chemistry and its applications. And then this is very important. The students actually get one week of introduction to Linux. Um, then they get a theory of molecular mechanics, uh, minimization and molecular dynamics, and then they use AMBER to calculate Gibbs energy and um, think about um, implicit and ex explicit solvation of a peptide. And then they do some binding energy calculations and then they have their midterm. Then they have spring research and they go on to um, my section of the course on electronic structures. And so then this is the section of the course that I developed and you can find on NanoHub. So electronic structure and quantum properties of atoms, molecules, and solid. So we start off by talking about variational methods. Then we talk about Hartree-Fock and the Slater determinants. We move on to discussing restricted versus unrestricted Hartree-Fock. Um, then we explore potential energy surfaces. These are electronic potential energy surfaces, um, Gaussian basis sets, vibrational modes, and then we briefly touch on density functional theory. Um, but mainly, we ran out of time the last time I taught this course, and we only focused on binding energies. Um, and then in the last week, we're, we review everything that we've done, and they have another midterm. These are the tutorials that are the sort of center uh, part of the course. And you can see all the ones in bold are the ones that we do on NanoHub. So there's just two that we don't do on NanoHub. So we have introduction to NanoHub, and we understand what's meant by a self-consistent field. Then we explore more of the tool that we use on NanoHub. We talk about optimizing structures and dissociation energies. Uh, finally, we get to calculating vibrational modes. And then you can see there's these other two tutorials that we do um, using Gaussian. And so now we've gotten to the practical part of the course where I'm going to walk you through tutorial one and also what you can find on the NanoHub course. And so tutorial one is just getting familiar with NanoHub and then also doing ab initio calculations with hydrogen gas. And so um, all of what's copied on here is actually from text from the tutorial. So I'm going to show you the tutorial in a second, and then also um, what the NanoHub course looks like. But it says, the goal of these activities is for you to get comfortable with running electronic structure calculations. We will be using the ORCA GUI housed on NanoHub to start. Um, ORCA can be run from the command line too. And as you might have guessed, in the um, first half of the course, the students learn Linux so that they can run uh, simulations from the command line. Um, and then this is to understand how the course is structured. It says to get credit for doing the tutorial, there are a number of activities that the students must do. And then they're going to submit their answers and work. 
for those activities, and what they have to submit is given by the tasks. So tasks or results to submit are indicated with bold. And then to start, uh, I just had them like click all the buttons on the GUI. So we'll get to that in a second. Now I'm going to share what the um, course looks like. OK, so here is the course, um, Computational Methods in Chemistry at San Francisco State. The number is 870. So. Um, you can see I give a overview of the course, kind of like I already did for you all this morning. And then I've included all of my lecture slides and videos. It turned out that um, I ended up teaching this course virtually due to the pandemic. And so I had recordings of all my videos of my lectures that um, the NanoHub folks so kindly edited and put on uh, available to you on this website. And so you can see here that we're going to do ab initio simulations with ORCA. So if you click on this link, it should take you to the ORCA tool, which we'll all use together in a second. Um, but before I get there, I just want to show you that um, I have solutions to my tutorials. So if you would like the solutions to the tutorials, um, you can join the chemistry instructors group and then get access to the solutions. Um, I'm sure you would be able to make your own solutions if you want. So the way the materials organized on NanoHub is that we have um, the lecture and then you can watch my lecture. Um, and then we have my lecture notes and then we also have the tutorials. And so you can sort of follow along the course by watching my lectures, um, looking at slides, and then looking at the tutorials. Um, yeah, so I imagine somebody might want to um, just pick some of the tutorials from scratch, might just want to see what a computational course using NanoHub um, was looked like and take inspiration from my course. So that was my motivation for putting all my materials on NanoHub. All right, and then the next thing that I want to show you before we go um, to the practical part of just clicking um, buttons and seeing how the ORCA tool works is that I wanted to show you what my tutorials look like. And I'm going to show you the key or the solution so that you can sort of see what you might get if you wanted to download all the solutions. OK, so you can see here that this is tutorial one, getting to know NanoHub and ab initio calculations. And I already read this goal to you and information about activities and tasks. So then the first day, we, we spend a long time getting people signed up for NanoHub. Um, so hopefully, you all have done that or already have done that so that when we go to explore the ORCA tool, you're already signed in. And then when you go to the ORCA tool, this is what you'll see. And so we're going to switch on advanced options to get more control. And then we're also just going to have the students um, write about what the tool can do. So I have their first task be to describe these different simulation types, a potential energy surface, geometry optimization, ionization energy, and normal mode analysis. And so we do all of this together in class. This is not necessarily homework. You know, we lecture a tiny bit in class, and then we go through the tutorials together in class. Um, and then if the students don't finish the tutorials in a timely fashion, then they uh, finish up those tutorials um, as homework or write more extensively about the simulations um, when we're not in class. All right, so let's go to the uh, ORCA tool and we can all do this together. Um, we're going to launch this tool. And it'll take a second, but much faster than if you were teaching students to get on a um, personal or university research cluster. 
And down here is the advanced options. So we would click yes, we want advanced options. And you can see you get extra tabs up at the top. So the extra tabs up at the top are geometric input where you can put in different atom configurations, um, energy expression and constraint optimization. So there's actually a lot of control that you can have on the simulations. So we have the students click on this um, drop down menu and you can see that when you pick a different type of simulation it highlights a different picture so you can um, use this picture to describe what the students are going to be doing and there's also built-in molecules that you can use so we have H2 and uh, water and you know a handful of different molecules we're just going to start with H2 for now because it's very fast and after we have the students explore the GUI that they see when they launch the ORCA tool, all we do is press simulate and see what happens. And so um, actually we wanna keep it on geometry optimization rather than ionization energy. Um, wait, let me just double check. We're going to do Oh, sorry, not geometry optimization, potential energy surface. So we'll do this potential energy surface and we'll click simulate. And all of you who are following along, you can also press, press simulate. And now you can see that the results are plotted by the tool. So we have our inner atomic distance in angstroms and we have our energy um, here. And then in this drop down menu, there are more things that we can look at. So we can also look at the um, molecular structure. Okay, we see H2. And then we can look at the output log. And this is what I really want to teach students to feel comfortable with is looking at the output from a simulation. Because as I said, one of my underlying motivations is to train my own research students or students who might eventually do research with me. And of course, we're going to be looking at this text-based output when we do research together. So I will eventually have the students download the output log so that um, they don't lose their results and we can look at them, they can look at them and use them to write their report. Okay, so we're actually not going to, well, you can download them if you want, but I don't need to do that right now. Um, so I'm going to go back to my slides to show you more about different tutorials that we do together and the type of questions that I ask students to write about and think about as they do these tutorials. Okay, so we're going to click on simulate, the job will start running, and then it's very fast, so the output will pop up. And then we click on the result, relax potential energy surface, and I have the students actually like sketch out the potential energy surface because I want them to engage with it very fully. And then they have to answer the following questions. What is the equilibrium bond length found by the simulation compared to the experimental bond length? And I don't give them the experimental bond length, so they have to take however long it takes for them to go on the internet and search um, for what they think the experimental bond length is. And then I ask them, what experiments can be done to actually find the experimental bond length? So how do they think that the scientists figured out what that bond length was? What is the minimum energy for the molecule? And then I ask them to do a bunch of conversions to get used to working in Hartree and EV, the actual results in kilocals, I think. And then I ask them, what is the meaning of the minimum energy found on the potential energy surface? And then what is the bonding energy for this molecule? Describe why your estimate from the plot might be inaccurate. So these are the type of questions that I had the students answer as part of their homework assignment tutorial. All right, and that's really all we do um, for the first tutorial. So then for the second tutorial, we explore ionization energies. And so um, I'm going to show you how we do this in part because it took me a long time to figure out how to simulate the helium, or not a long time, but it wasn't obvious how I would simulate 
the helium atom. So in tutorial two, we are going to calculate the ionization and explore the missing correlation energy between the because of the interaction of the two electrons in helium. Um, so you'll see that the experimental value for um, ionization of helium is 0 0.9033 hard trees. And so we're going to compare the value that we calculated to the experimental value. Um, we're going to see if it's larger or smaller. Um, I tell them that the difference between the two numbers is due to a number of factors, including missing correlations from the electrons. And I ask the students to explain why missing correlation might make their value higher or lower than the experimental value. OK, so we're going to go back to input. And we want to edit the geometric input. And the, the way to create the helium molecule is given, like the instructions are given in my tutorials. So if um, you know your student missed lecture for some reason, they could also figure out how to do this simulation um, by reading the tutorial. So we'll go to geometric input. Put, and we're going to use Cartesian coordinates instead of the Z matrix. And then we're going to delete all of these values here. And then we will um, put helium because we want to simulate the helium atom. And we're just going to put it at the origin, so 0, 0, 0. And then it turns out that Orca is expecting more than two atoms. And so in order to get Orca to run, we have to create an atom called a dummy atom. So DA stands for dummy atom. And so if you want to simulate just one atom or just one ion, um, you would have to make this second dummy atom. And then finally, you can control the initial, and I think it constrains it as well, um, electronic state, so you can control the spin and the charge of your simulation. So now that we've um, created this structure for our helium atom, we can um, go back to basic input and say that we want to calculate the ionization energy. Um, and then we would press simulate. And it shouldn't take very long. So here we could click on ionization energy. And so here it is showing you your results. And that's all I'm going to really say about this tutorial. There's lots of interesting questions provided in the actual tutorial that the students have to answer. Um, I wanted to show you one last simulation tool we use. Um, the normal mode analysis for one of our um, simulations. And so um, we actually use calculate the normal modes of water. And um, we do in that tutorial and some of the other tutorials change the energy expression so that we can see how changing um, the basis that we use, the precision, um, helps us to get more accurate results. And so in this simulation, we actually um, use DFT to calculate some of them. So you could, for example, um, pick density functional theory to do these calculations. So let's see how long that's going to take us to run these simulations. In the meantime, I'm going to prepare to go back to my slides um, to talk to you about uh, sort of what is the purpose of how do I motivate the normal mode analysis calculations. In this tutorial, we're going to look at normal modes and IR spectroscopy. The main goal of these activities is to calculate the infrared absorbent spectra from nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2. And the tutorial was taken from a tutorial that I found on the Colby College uh, server. And I asked the person who developed the tutorial if I could share his materials and adapt it for NanoHub. And he said yes. So that was awesome. 
So most of the tutorial is structured after that tutorial that I found from a colleague. And so um, the, the first step is to optimize the geometry of these two molecules. And oh, actually we were using, uh, we were using molecular overdose not DFT in the beginning and then we switched to DFT later. And so um, it turns out that when you click the vibrational uh, mode, the molecule will first um, be optimized, the geometry will first be optimized, and then the normal mode analysis will happen. And so I give them a hint, too, that they should be careful setting up the inputs for O2 um, because they should think about what the spin of the molecule should be. And so when we... Uh, there's here's a figure from the tutorial that shows the um, infrared spectrum of air so that we can check to see if our normal mode calculations match um, some of these frequencies that we see from the spectrum. So we're going to simulate CO2 and water and then as well as oxygen and see how they match with the experiment. So that's sort of the end of my um, talk about my practical um, introduction to the ORCA tool and how I use it in my course. The rest of the slides are actually just more background on myself and the other tutorials that don't use um, NanoHub. So we might finish early, which is probably totally fine for all of you. Um, and then we'll have time to ask questions or keep exploring the tool. So tutorial three, um, I really want students to understand restricted versus unrestricted calculations. And so I have them plot charge density and spin density files that were created um, with Gaussian. And so you can see here the students learn to use um, VMD to plot the charge densities of this CH3 molecule. And one of the pros of this tutorial is that students get familiar with Gaussian and VMD, and then they also get to practice with their Linux skills and using Vim to edit text input files that are text-based. And so this is really important for me in that some of these students potentially might do research with me, and I want them to feel comfortable running simulations from the command line. But this may not be important for some other people, um, and so it might be nice if this tutorial was also available on NanoHub. And so, as I said, some of the cons of this tutorial is that the students had to learn about Gaussian, they had to learn a little bit about Linux, and then they had to learn how to edit text files with Vim. Um, but what's nice for my part is that the students learn Linux and Vim during the first half of the course when they're doing the molecular mechanics tutorials, and so I don't actually teach that material. I just assume that they know those things. And then tutorial six, we calculate the binding energy of CO2 to a metal organic framework um, sort of as a little toy model of looking at carbon capture. and so. We take a little fragment of a metal organic framework. It's, it's really small. Um, I think it's just a benzene ring. And then we calculate the binding energy of the CO2 to this benzene ring. And one of the reasons that I chose to use Gaussian rather than NanoHub for this, this tutorial is that I wanted students to continue practicing um, their skills using Gaussian from tutorial three. So I don't think it was necessary to do this tutorial um, on our chemistry cluster, but I thought it would be good to have students practice using Gaussian again. And then it was also easier to like create the molecules um, with Vim and not have to copy them into um, NanoHub. But I bet that we could create, we could edit Orca so that you could have drop down imports of your starting positions if you wanted to do a similar binding energy type calculation. Finally, I just wanna talk about some other stuff that I do in case you are interested in 
things that I do other than teaching computational chemistry using NanoHub. So as I mentioned before, I um, teach an introduction to Python course, and that's associated with some other data science activities that I do at San Francisco State. So I'm the co-PI of a NSF grant called Graduate Opportunities to Learn Data Science, and together with my colleagues, we developed a data science certificate for master's students in chemistry and biology, and this is the link to the website for that program. So if you're like, wow, I'm really interested in this data science um, certificate for master's students, well, please go to this website. And then I'm also a PI on this NSF grant called it's finished now, but it was an NSF grant called Promoting Inclusivity in Computing, um, PINK, so we named them both after colors. Um, and it's an applications minor, a computer applications minor. And as sort of synergized with that minor, we have a summer program. And so I co-organized this synergistic PINK summer program. So the PINK summer program is a free nine week, 10 hours per week coding research experience for um, San Francisco State undergraduates. And it's designed to recruit students for research labs and the pink applications minor. Um, students uh, are in little groups of like three to five and they do sort of a crash course in learning to code in R or Python. Um, for about two weeks, and then the rest of the time they apply that knowledge to solving a research problem that is designed by faculty at San Francisco State. And um, the program costs us money to run because we give the faculty a little bit of money to um, thank them for their efforts, and then we also hire peer mentors who spend the majority of the 10 hours a week with the students um, going through the introductory coding material with them, and then also um, working on the research project with them. Finally, I teach this um, first course in the application minor, which we call an introduction to an interdisciplinary approach to computer programming. That's that introduction to Python course. And most of the, the seats in that course are reserved for non-computer science majors. Um, so it's usually filled with biology and chemistry students, and we use uh, Google Colab, but we, of course, could uh, host our Jupyter Notebooks on NanoHub if we so felt like doing. Um, and then here's the link for the pink miner, if you're curious about the structure of our pink miner. Uh, and so, as I said, we're probably going to end early unless we get tons of questions or people want to look at the tutorials in more depth. Uh, I want to really thank the NanoHub team um, for helping me get my course on NanoHub, all my course materials, especially uh, Tanya Faltons and Joe Saichas. Um, oh, I forgot to put my NSF grant number. Um, I should go look that up and put it in. But um, yeah, the development of this course and course materials was supported by um, the Vi Division of Materials Research, and um, you know the NSF also funded NanoHub, so that's awesome. And then I want to thank all my students who inspire me to understand this material more deeply, clearly, and efficiently. Um, and then I thank all of you for your interest and attention in either watching my um, seminar later or for coming. Um, simultaneously while I give this talk. And so you're all welcome to email me with questions about my courses or any of my other activities that you might be interested in. This is Nicole A.L. Um, at sfsu.edu. And I'd be happy to share other materials with people that are not available on NanoHub. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Adelstein. I'll start with our first question. Uh, we have someone who asked, how do you introduce DFT to students who have no background of quantum mechanics? Do you give overview or review, or do you add quantum mechanics as a prerequisite? Quantum mechanics is a prerequisite for this course. So um, we do do a review of quantum mechanics uh, I don't know, uh, let me go back to the layout of the course. 
you can see that the first week is called variational methods. So that's uh, like really intense review of quantum mechanics all the way up to the variational methods part. Um, but yes, we do ask that students have taken quantum before. Or as I said, you could just skip talking about the theory of density functional theory and just use it as like another um, simulation tool. All right, great. The next question for the certificate course for graduate students, is it online? It is not online. So um, we would love to put our materials online, but we found that we're trying to build um, sort of confidence and identity with doing data science, and it really helps to have the students working together um, in person. So we have not transitioned to a place where we could like offer it online right now. All right, the next question, is there a tutorial for simulations of absorption spectra in the visible and PL spectra? Um, they said they followed that up with saying in ORCA. Ah, so in ORCA, there is simply the vibrational mode um, sort of sub tool. So the normal mode analysis. Um, I think that a lot of the molecules sort of their vibrational, it calculates all of their vibrational modes. So some of them are in the visible range. Um, depending on which molecules you simulate. But no, I don't think, there, there's not a tutorial available, if that's a specific question. All right, uh, and then the next question, do you have a tutorial about H atom with hand calculation and codes? The H atom rather than the H molecule. Let me go look. I can't remember if we look at the hydrogen molecule as well as the helium molecule. No, so my tutorial does not cover um, the sort of simulating the hydrogen atom, but I talk about it a lot in my lectures. So you could go into my lecture material and you would find probably a lot of information to sort of beef up the helium atom tutorial to also cover the hydrogen atom. All right, great. So the next question is, as a professor in data science and computation for non-CS students, do you ever encounter challenges with students that haven't programmed before and haven't yet learned how to think in code? How do you overcome this in your courses where you maybe don't get to spend as much time covering this material? Yeah, I would say that about half of the students in this course don't have any programming experience. And I think that that is one of the like major benefits of using NanoHub is that you can, um, teach them computational chemistry concepts and skills without with them having basically no um, no experience with coding or thinking about code. Um, however, my colleague, Dr. Guliev, who teaches the molecular mechanics part of the course, he decided to take time to teach the students Linux. So, they are a little bit familiar with working at the command line, but many of them have not um, seen programming before, except that I do teach a little bit of programming in my physical chemistry courses. So the prerequisites for this course are physical chemistry, um, which is why they would have quantum. Um, and so uh, if they took physical chemistry with me, they would have a tiny amount of sort of introduction to programming. And it's my belief that all science degrees should start to include programming as a 
learning objective for getting a degree because as we go into the future, everybody should be able to do a little bit of programming. So um, I'm trying to make that a reality here at San Francisco State by teaching programming in my classes and then also trying to convince my colleagues to start introducing more um, programming into their classes. All right, the next question is, do you have a tutorial on HF and Slater determinants, Gaussian basis sets? How much do you get in depth about these topics? Yeah, so um, that tutorial is um, the, the one that I didn't show you where we really get into, we use Gaussian code and we talk a lot about um, Gaussian basis sets. And so let me see if I can find it. We do a lot of calculations where we change the number of basis sets that we use or the size of the basis set and see how that affects the answer. Yeah, and we go into depth into Hartree Falk in tutorial three. So let me just show you. Tutorial three is a really intense tutorial down here where we start to sort of plot the charge and spin densities. And so this is where we really get into depth about hartree fock calculations. So we are going to use the Gaussian to explore the difference between um, restricted hartree fock unrestricted hartree fock um, restricted open shell hartree fock So yes, we do get really in-depth um, into uh, talking about hartree fock and then we don't really have a tutorial that's just on Gaussian basis sets. Sort of throughout all the tutorials, we try different basis sets and see how it affects the result. And so, yeah, I really, if you were interested to see sort of um, how in depth I talk about it, I would go and download all of my slides because you would see in my slides how many slides I'm devoting to talking about um, those concepts. Le yeah, like I would download these lecture notes, 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 notes. Uh, the next question is, what exactly means semi-empirical methods in ORCA? Oh, you're talking about ORCA itself. I'm not positive. I mean, we could go look at it together. Let's see, where does it say semi-empirical methods? Could the person who asked this question say a little bit more about these semi-empirical methods? Uh, in the meantime, um, the next question, possibly a request, could you design a tutorial with the same set of molecules to illustrate the aims of various topics progressively or same set of molecules using throughout the course? Yes, so um, we actually don't use that many different molecules. So we start off with H2. We go to helium because I want to talk about how correlation affects ionization energy. And then um, for the charge density and spin density, I would have to think about uh, how to modify that to go away from the CH3 molecule. Um, but then when we uh, do the vibrational mode analysis and the binding energy, we, we also use small molecules. So we could also do the binding energy of water instead of carbon dioxide, but I was motivated to do carbon dioxide because of carbon capture. So I'm not sure that I would want to restrict um, the molecules that we worked with only to like three or four. I think, you know, working with maybe the six different molecules that we use is not that overwhelming for the students. I don't know, the person who asked this question, I'm, I'm curious as to why you would want to um, restrict the number of molecules that was introduced to the students. Yeah, we can let them follow up with that one if they want. And then a follow-up to the previous question. It says, in 
the front end of ORCA says ab initio, DFT, and semi empirical methods. Hmm. Okay, so I didn't create the or uh, the the ORCA tool. I just decided that it was the appropriate one for me to use. Um, semi empirical methods. I am not sure which one they would be talking about. You know, these are the options for your energy expression. You can use Hartree-Fock, DFT, Hartree-Fock plus perturbation theory, coupled cluster, and complete active space um, self-consistent field. So I'm not really sure which one of these they would be referring to as semi-empirical. I think we'd have to ask the, the designers of the tool. All right, we had a couple of maybe related questions. Um, can you clarify what type of programming? When you say programming, you mean writing in a scripting language like Python or JavaScript or Perl and not C++ or Java? And then kind of a follow-up, which language do you recommend students know in terms of programming? Yeah, so in my physical chemistry classes, we use Python in part because I primarily use Python for my analysis. Um, I would highly recommend teaching students Python because it still is one of the most widespread and powerful languages um, that's used in industry and science. So you're preparing your students um, for a number of different careers by getting them um, comfortable with Python. And, you know, um, since we have a lot of, not a lot of time, but we have time, I could try to pull up one of my uh, physical chemistry Jupyter notebooks um, to show what kind of programming that we do. But it really is like a lot of times just using Python for plotting. So rather than having students plot with Excel, I show them how to plot with Python just as a way of getting used to um, Python and sort of interacting with um, a computer using commands. Um, so yeah, let, let me see if I can pull up that one of those um, Jupyter notebooks. Um, quickly enough, but I could answer another question if there was one while I went to go see if I could pull up one of those Jupyter notebooks. Yeah, um, there was a question. How many processors are allowed to run in a DFT calculation in NanoHub? If you needed to run a very intense calculation with lots of processors, you might have to work directly with NanoHub to like get more than sort of the standard to run the small calculations. All right, were you still pulling something else up, Dr. Adelstein, or? I was in part because I, but but I, it took me a second because I was answering questions. So, but here we go. Um, but anyways, you can see the important part, which is like in the beginning, we we just are plotting we're learning how to plot. And then the fun thing that we do in the beginning is that we plot the um, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So this kind of gives you an idea of uh, what type of Python I'm teaching my students in my PCHEM classes. And if you wanted me to send you these notebooks, um, please just email me and I would send you um, my PCHEM Jupyter Notebooks, or maybe eventually I'll host them on NanoHub. So that could be a project for another semester. Yeah, that'd be great. And then the last question I'm seeing now, if someone asked, can you bring up the slide uh, with the reference books again? Yeah, okay, here's, now I can refresh myself. Yes, we use Macquarie quantum chemistry in my chemistry class. And so that's where all the problems are taken from for the student's first homework in computational chemistry. If you have any other books that you recommend, please also email me and tell me of some other wonderful computational chemistry books. 
So thank you again, Dr. Alstein, for that great presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today and joining us and for asking all these great questions. Thanks, you all.